Hello and welcome to Innovation Mind Spotlight series. Each month we are talking with top leaders and innovation experts about their ideas, strategies, tools and experience to help the world continue to innovate and thrive. I'm really happy to have two of the leaders of the industry and good friends of mine joining us today. Dr. Brooke Dabney is the founder of Innovation One and through his empirical research created the Innovation One Health Index. Brooke is also a professor of strategy and has served as a dean and associate dean at the Edwards School of Business, University of Saskatchewan. Victor Asad is another guest who is the managing partner of Innovation One, CEO of Victor Asad Strategic Human Resources and the author of Hack Recruiting, the best of empirical research method and process and digitization. So without further ado, let's dive in. Victor and uh, Brooke, what's the backstory? How did you meet and uh, how did you come together? And uh, what is the point of the intersection like? Okay, we got an idea here. We got a great concept. Why don't we go and venture out, start a company to spread the wisdom? What, what is the trigger? Well, we actually met in your uh, neck of the woods there, Bala. We met in Silicon Valley. Wow. And Brooke was bringing, I had started my consulting business there and in HR. And Brooke was bringing down students from the university and touring, you know, Google and, and, and uh, the innovation labs there. And, and Brooke, maybe you want to tell that story. Great. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a professor of innovation and strategy at the University of Saskatchewan. And uh, I was bringing down a group of 20 students to Silicon Valley as a, uh, as a uh, class in, in innovation management, just showing them all the uh, ins and outs of some of these large companies they've heard about and access their technology, but really didn't know a whole lot about how they work from an innovation perspective. So uh, Victor and I met down there. We met through a casual acquaintance, a friend of ours, and uh, he brought us together and we were talking about innovation and other things of interest that were common. And uh, sooner or later, a uh, discussion came up about why don't we uh, look at getting into business together for this, because it was a nice match with what Victor was doing, not only in his background, but also uh, with his HR business. And a lot of uh, innovation management platforms are established uh, or supported by the HR function in organizations. So it just makes so, sense. So, you know, something that really, you know, hit me like a lightning bolt, uh, <laughs> Bala, was that in my work as an HR leader with Medtronic's coronary and peripheral business, in Santa Rosa, California, they needed to bring to market a new product, a drug eluting stent with a revolutionary polymer uh, and drug on it. Uh, these are stents for opening up clogged arteries in the heart. And Medtronic, and particularly this unit, was excellent at program management. When they knew they had a product to bring to market, they had this uh, five step process of getting all the functions together to commercialize it and to drive out every variability to live up to the Medtronic mission so every product was reliable and dependable. But, they weren't, but that culture killed innovation, killed the front end of innovation. And back in, at that time, we, I didn't know about Brooks' assessment, but there wasn't really a good assessment for an organization to be innovative. And, and what this organization at that time missed is to understand that you need to have 200 failures and create a culture of, of innovation failing fast, frequently, and feverishly mm -hmm. to get that $1 billion product. And so the, the mindset around program management is to drive out variation, you know, and it's a different program manager that does that. And Medtronic was brilliant with these people. Innovation is just the opposite. We got to fail all the time to figure out what works. And it was like, ah, oh, failure, failure. And, and so these cultures have to complement each other. And so Brooks, uh, the research that Brooke has done that led to the Innovation One Health Index, I thought this is brilliant because it helps people understand the culture you need for innovation and it can coexist 
with delivering great products and great services and meeting this quarter's you know numbers, financial numbers. And so I thought this was brilliant, and you know we really need to tell the world about. It. Awesome. So uh, definitely we should talk about the health innovation index. It seems to be pretty impressive, right? Uh, before well, that. Yeah, I'm I mean, actually, what is that? Very thrilled to see the combination of you bringing the HR and innovation leadership and Roof is bringing the academic and research background. Wow, that's a super combination, right? For any company to have that kind of transformation mindset, you are having all these magic ingredients there. So I would say you can be the messiah for any enterprises out there who are trying to transform their own culture and talent. Wow. So speaking of this health index, so uh, is that a kind of prescription that you'll be giving back to the company, how they can be innovative, or is it centered around the talent, our processes, frameworks, so who is going to be benefiting from that and what it contains and what it means for these enterprises out there? Yeah, well, I, the uh, Innovation Health Index, when I first started research in that area, prior to that I was, working with strategy and organizations. And there was always something seemed to be missing in the strategy uh, domain. And that was strategies, plans that were informed through innovation. So I refer to those as innovation informed strategies. And there was no real research out there. What was out there was people thinking about things, but there was nothing that was done properly in terms of defining, you know, how to measure innovation in an organization. So it took me maybe seven or eight years to come up with the Innovation Health Index based on solid research. So it's no different than bringing a new vaccine onto the marketplace. You want to you wanna make sure that what you say you can do, you can actually do. And so it's been tested. Uh, we did publish lots of papers on peer-reviewed journals. And in 2008, we came up with the Innovation Health Index uh, measure. And it was the first comprehensive measure based on uh, what I'd call uh, research, you know, like, like evidence-based research to measure innovation culture. So to put it in terms that people might understand better, it's really like taking an MRI of the organization. Hmm. So understanding where the issues are in the organization and then applying, you know, your efforts, resources to, to uh, dealing with those issues uh, or, or uh, opportunity, whatever they may be, to advance your innovation platform. So organizations can do it in a very systematic process way. And the whole idea behind it is to look at the drivers of innovation. That was a whole thing behind the research was to discover what drives innovation in organizations. And we came up with 12 drivers across four dimensions. And, and like you say, it's a holistic measurement, it's robust and it's discriminatory. And, uh, you know, it really gives an org organizations a head start in terms of, you know, how can we get going in innovation? What do we need to do without wasting time, money, effort, having false starts? And a lot of organizations we run into uh, have tried innovation three or four times or two or three times on their own. And they, they use the term, we've, had, we've already had a false start or two. We don't want a third one. And uh, so then, you know, they, they start looking at outside uh facilitators who know what they're doing and that's how that's where we come in awesome so that's pretty impressive i think uh, it is the need of the time right especially when you are uh, going through these challenging times and most of the companies are thinking to be innovative how to overcome all these constraints and turn those constraints into opportunities that's pretty beautiful and uh, i can't stop asking the question so Will you just give the report and then move on? Or there is a continuum that you will also tell them or coach them and walk them through like, this is how you should be able to turn around your culture. So what is the continuum? What happens after you are given the prescription or kind of report? So, well, okay, okay, go ahead, Victor. Yeah. Go, okay, <laughs> thank you. So a big part of, of the index is that you, know, you get a score across all of these 12 drivers that Brooke talked about that power innovation. And in addition to the score, you get a benchmarking. So uh, there are over 3000 companies and this is a global d database that's in uh, Brooke's, uh, you know, the database that we have and the database that he's created. And so it's been segmented out into 
uh, now nine different industries and also several different countries. So we can give you a benchmark to show how others in your industry are doing with innovation and what your strengths are and what your areas are for improvement. And, um, and talk through that with you, make sure you, you understand it and, and make sure that you understand what improvement looks like in each of these drivers. What are the specific actions that companies do to become better? And um, in addition to that, there's a process that Brooke has developed, the blueprint process, where it takes the executives of the company through a strategic discussion about what type of opportunities and threats are ahead of them and what type of innovations they believe they need. And are they, you know, just in product development or service development or across the company? And how quickly do they need to move? As Brooke is fond of saying, innovation is contextual. Mm -hmm. and, and from there, they can, we map out with them, you know, a plan about what they can do next week, next quarter, next year, and two years down the road, and working with them to prioritize what to do first based on their data and their data to the benchmark. Awesome. So this looks like from layman terms, can we call this like Myers-Briggs type kind of assessment or strengths finder for individuals, what actually you're doing with the health index is for the company's innovation? Is it kind of similar or how do you put it in layman terms? It's an assessment, and and I, yeah. I when I when I first branched out to start doing this research, it was a bit of a, a change from what I was doing. You know, there, there was a, a lot of assessments out there to measure organizational culture in general, awesome. and and innovation has been defined as a culture of the way people think and act in an organization. So I said, if we can measure, generally speaking, organizational culture, why don't we? Why don't I attempt to measure innovation culture because that seemed to be a word 10, 15 years ago that wasn't going away. It was a word that was commonly used. Not a lot of people understood it. Uh, you know, they would try a few things. They would say they were being innovative. They really didn't know. It was random. It was, in, it was incremental, but random. And uh, so, you know, the, the whole point was, okay, can we actually help organizations help themselves? And, uh, and through this process, as Victor has mentioned, uh, you know, we identify the weak areas uh, in, in, in your platform that need to be patched or fixed before you can actually advance. Uh, every organization, Bala, wants something different from innovation. There's no one sort of process. I mean, but this is a generalized construct uh, or, or, or a measure that, that all organizations can benefit from, whether you're uh, not for profit right through to the largest organizations in, in, in North America or the world. It just has that holistic approach what really and it really it defines um, you know your innovation platform at the time. So it, that's the key thing. It's actually objective and uh, it's not something that we think. It's something we've talked to all the employees about. It, we, we assess innovation mm -hmm. culture using a uh, platform, a survey platform. Uh, it's, it's like we said robust. There's lots of of organizations in the database, Victor said 3,000, and that's not including the employees within those. So there's tens of thousands of data points that we have yeah. now to work with. And that's the key thing. The more data we have, the more confident we get with the model. That's always there, right? So this is, again, actually interesting. The more and more we are knowing about it, I think enterprises should really go through these kind of introspection. So speaking of this uh, Innovation One Health Index, I keep hearing a lot of accolades about your recent uh, Global State of Innovation Survey. What is the correlation between the Innovation Index versus Survey? Is this actually complementing or supplementing each other, or there are two <clears throat> different directions that you want to take with this Survey versus Index? Indeed. So, uh, so the the basis of the work that we did with the Conference Board is that we use the core questions of the Innovation One Health Index. Uh, to see how companies are doing against these 12 drivers. And then we, what we add to it are what are the current themes in innovation? And some of those questions, these additional questions that we ask to keep the tool 
current and to address what, what leaders want to know, some of these questions came to us from the innovation conference uh, councils that the conference board has. So they're wanting to know what's the importance of uh, sponsorship of innovation? How important is a team manager for innovation? How important are things like stage gating, kind of traditional processes for innovation, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, agile methodology, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know, uh, design thinking, vis-a-vis uh, -vis software pro program management and crowdsourcing, things that you know a lot about, Bala. So we did uh, the survey with them. This is the second time we've done it with them. And, and what came back is strong confirmation first that the you know we we take these the survey and we divide the companies between those that are highly innovative and not so innovative using good statistical analysis and and then we look you know and what that shows is that the companies that remain being highly innovative as Brooks said they treat innovation as a strategic imperative they really work it hard as important as the finance plan the marketing plan the sales plan and the importance of culture, it's number one. That and listening to your customers are number one. And then we looked at how important, you know, based on these new questions, how important is the role of the manager? Well, it's very critical. Companies that have a, a manager that encourages innovation, recognizes the team, that team does better in innovation and so does the culture. We looked at the role of sponsorship and we found that in highly innovative companies, Changing the sponsor doesn't matter so much. Where in low innovators, it mattered a lot because the, the sponsor was your sole security for innovation. In a highly innovative company, they have these strong cultures that keeps the innovation marching forward even without a great sponsor. And when we looked at technology, what we found is that certainly, you know, stage gating, uh, experimental design, you know, control group at the experiment, you know, this fast prototyping is critically remains critically important, but artificial intelligence and big data analysis were critical tools, but they're tools to remember to use. And, and same with software project management and crowdsourcing. Um, crowdsourcing is going through kind of a revolution as it becomes cheaper and better and easier to use. You know, at first it was pretty expensive but you know, it's getting much better. And so what we found is that the highly innovative companies, they are diving into using these digital tools, big data analysis, software platforms, uh, crowdsourcing, artificial intelligence, but wait, there's a big surprise here. Mm -hmm. If they don't have a good open collaborative culture, their technology doesn't work. You know, these digital technologies don't work. Our friends at the Boston Consulting Group found that 87% of digitization efforts failed. And this is work from two years ago because their cultures rejected it in some form or another. McKinsey came out with very similar results. Now, there's also issues of IT project management and so on that are important. But again, as, as, as digital technology gets easier and easier to use through advances like what your company brings, it gets to be a better tool. And then companies now can, can tactically move quicker with innovation because they have more tools to do things that, are, that we find are important, like measure your progress. You know, a lot of companies are looking for one hit wonders with products or services and they're looking for that lightning bolt, that eureka, but you know, innovation takes some slugging through it. And you gotta measure figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And you gotta have good project management skills. And so in this research, again, bears that out. So it's, it's a lot of insight. We're very glad to have our partnership with the conference board. Yeah. Um, so wow. those are some of the big findings that, that we, we have from it. And, you know, it, again, for us, and we're culture people, but uh, we, it gets back to, you, you know, the, the ex top executives have to articulate a culture, and Brooke says this well all the time. They have to invite everybody in, including their external partners, to innovate around what their strategies are and have a process to move innovations forward that everyone understands 
great knowledge management systems, and then what I call the graveyard of innovation. They 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 have to align their back offices to commercial, you know, manufacturing and sales and marketing to commercialize this this great product they decide to go forward with. And a lot of them, that's where it fails. And to to to, to just build on what Victor's saying, you know, uh, this coming back to the research, we often get quite asked the question, why? should be innovative at all as a company? What, what's the benefit of innovation to a company? And again, you know, we've been asked those questions long enough that we decided to go out and do some research on, you know, is it beneficial for organizations? And, and over the years, we've now published three or four papers in referee journals that talk about the financial impacts of organizations that have high innovation profiles and or, or, or platforms. And there's no doubt about it. There is uh, a significant difference in financial output in all almost all the all the measures of performance in an organization when you compare the high innovating organizations to the lower innovating organizations based on our score that are in the same industries and you start looking at their financial correlating those with financial and market results and and to me after seeing these results i'm not sure why any organization wouldn't want to be more innovative. It exactly. just, that yeah. should be the thing, you know, innovation should be their strategy or very, very big part of their strategy. And, it, and that's where organizations have difficulty because innovation's a way of thinking. It's a, it's a culture and a way people yeah. think, whereas strategies, a process of doing things like, you know, timelines, budgets. What happens is organizations will often say, okay, let's become more innovative. So they, piggyback it onto their strategy process to give it a timeline to give it a budget and it often doesn't work it doesn't work like that innovation and strategy are mutually exclusive concepts but they're interdependent and they have to work together and awesome. that's, yeah. so the, those organizations uh, that are the most successful have got it figured out that way awesome so uh, speaking of that criticality or uh, uh, need of the innovation right now right here we all know we've been actually seeing the importance and the impact it's creating towards the successful companies, but there are certain section out there. Sometimes actually they may have a little bit of skeptical approach towards innovation, especially when all these things are going in this world. Uh, are you asking me to drop everything, focus on the innovation? And especially you can actually think of like, there are some usual suspects, right? When it comes to innovation, people may complain like, Hey, we are not getting enough support or sponsorship from the leadership team. There is not much alignment or we are not able to continuously keep up the employees' momentum, engagement. So there are few usual suspects, usually people cite the reasons for innovation failure. But now in this context, with all the COVID, we are even having few more laundry items, I would say. I keep hearing from some of the chief innovation officers, what are the challenges you guys are facing now? And they're saying that along with our usual battle, now we are also being challenged. How innovation HR departments, organizations will be able to support and enable this remote work culture. And also when you're looking around yourself, the social, uh, kind of uh, instability and uh, a lot of conversations are going on about diversity inclusion. How we can use innovation as a tool or leverage for solving those kind of things. And then they're also talking about there are many problems to be solved by this innovation, but at the same time, we are not having a lot of budget. So there is going to be a budget record. On the other side, there is going to be so much expectation for innovation HR team. So having said that, how this health index plus the combination of your survey and all your approach is going to be helping the leaders right now, right here, when they are going through these kind of difficult and challenging times? Yeah, it's, you know, I'm going to go back to Medtronic to start to, to answer the issues that you've raised there. So. Back in 2012, long before we knew anything about COVID-19, we implemented a remote work uh, environment there. And we did it because young people didn't want to leave San Francisco to come up to Santa Rosa to work. They liked the excitement of San Francisco. And who could blame them? And uh, so 
we put in place a remote work system where including the sales force, 45% of our workforce could work remotely coming into the office uh, one or two days a week. And they loved it. We had a 22% gain in productivity. We saved two million a year because we got out of facilities. We cut back on carbon emissions, morale went up. It was a soaring success. But to be successful, we had to train leaders and employees on new operating norms, how to meet and work together using digital tools as a team. Now the digital tools have improved since then, but you know, setting up these operating norms and then also working with people to set limits to their workday that once were defined by the commute both ways was important. But once that was figured out, this thing worked beautifully. People loved it. They still are doing it and it's expanded. And I work with companies today on it. Go to innovation. Um, companies still need to innovate. And there's been a really um, false narrative in Silicon Valley, Bala, that you have to have everyone together every day, 24 seven to innovate. Exactly. You know? yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, whether it's Zoom, you know, and I've been on meetings with Zoom where we have 60 people and you go into sub teams and have sub team meetings and come back and have report outs, you know, just like what we used to do in the office. And so we have some great tools to innovate digitally. You have some great tools to innovate digitally with your crowdsourcing platform, your different thons, you know, the, the project management pieces. These, you know, as Brooke has pointed out, the worst strategy is to do nothing. The status quo is a guarantee of failure, particularly now. And so companies can be, you know, bipolar in their thinking. Yes, they have to keep a focus on the bottom line, meeting today's commitments, whether it's manufacturing, sales, marketing, customer service, service providing, certainly. And what we have found is that you have to work hard at being innovative and not just in research and development, but across the platform. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 your enterprise. So whether it's a team that now has, you know, everyone working remotely, that team manager and being empathetic and helping people overcoming the problems of too many Zoom meetings and how to get together and make it work, uh, or they're being tired of the Zoom cocktail hour, you know, working through those issues and then working the, the, the keep your agenda focused on the innovations that you need and, and your goals for this quarter. Absolutely. We know from research, and I, and I can mention other researchers uh, who work in remote work area like Kate Lister and so on, you know, we know how to make remote work work long before COVID-19. And companies still can go a long ways to optimize it, not just for productivity, but to continue their innovation projects. And a lot of that now can be done, you know, using, using the, the digital tools that are available to them and conventional tools like this one, Zoom. Um, but you got to, you know, the executives have to keep a focus on it, keep talking about it. Um, and that's the brilliance of, of Brooks' work. And when I work with executives, you know, I tell them, when you get tired of talking about innovation, you're probably talking about it enough. You have to keep emphasizing it till you're nauseous about it because you have to keep that message out there and keep that encouragement and, and keep rewarding these teams and highlighting them. Exactly. And, yeah, but you know, we're, the new, the normal ain't coming back. We're defining the new normal. And you know, my prediction is when offices reopen, most people, half of them probably won't come into the office every day. They're gonna to continue to remote work, but offices will be better at getting people together safely and doing the collaboration that that still is pretty cool when it's done in the same room together face to face safely. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think but, uh, you know we're never going back to the old way of doing things. No, I think that's beautifully articulated, uh, Victor. Uh, speaking of uh, that particular topic, I would say that it is timely that Innovation Minds, the company that uh, I work for, and your organization, Innovation One, recently come to a partnership, right? We are so excited about all the opportunities out there. In continuation to your point earlier, what do you think are where and how this partnership is going to be meaningful for our enterprise clients? Why they should care about these two companies coming together? What is it for them? So from your perspective. 
Well, from my perspective, we've got two companies that specialize in a particular area. We're really good at what we do, probably the best in terms of measurement, uh, laying out a blueprint for innovation for the organization to pursue. Uh, and that's where we spend our time and effort. I mean, our research has been focused specifically on that. And we just don't stop with one paper. We're, we've got three or four papers on the go all the time. And that's the way we compete because, you know, when you think about some of the people out there that are in our space, and Victor has mentioned a couple already, you know, McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, Bain, we are not those people in terms of size and infrastructure. We are what we preach. We're nimble, we're quick, we're good, we're uh, affordable, and, you know, but a lot of the things that we do is, a, is a, through the assessment, and the assessment's a diagnostic, and following that assessment, there's a prescriptive approach. And in that prescriptive approach, there's often, you know, you need to, uh, you know, have a process to evaluate new ideas better, quickly, more efficiently, whatever the case is. And that's where, you know, we look to others, like your, your, your organization, who've developed a very, very, you know, nice approach to doing that. So instead of us trying to do that, it just makes sense. It's more efficient and effective for our organizations and the organizations we work with. Awesome. So that's pretty <laughs> Every, uh, And uh, by the way, for the sake of audience, uh, should they type in browser like innovation1.com or org, how our audience will be able to find out more details about your offerings, especially around easy, the uh, easy, well as uh, easy to remember, innovation1.io, as if it's innovation1 again. Innovation1.io. Ah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> So I think, uh, Victor, you're walking the walk or talking the talk of innovation, right? So I don't realize that innovation1.io is having this kind of uh, creative thought behind it. Wow, that's beautiful. Good. I think we are almost coming to the last part of our uh, conversation here, especially in this spotlight series. I'm going to be asking one last question as a parting thought. Uh, we talked about all these great things. Um, I'm going to be walking away with so much inspiration now that I learned about your health index and also survey results and the combination of the power of innovation one plus innovation minds, what it means for the enterprise science, how it is going to be helpful for them to transform the culture to be more offensive and ahead of the curve with innovation. This is all good. But still, there could be a little bit of skepticism when you are looking into the reality like, these are challenging times. Should I really invest on innovation and then double down? Or actually, should I go after my core product and ensure that I'm not turning over the Apple card, I'm focusing on what I'm doing really good because I want to sustain the business. There are two camps, right? So maybe as a last uh, thought, what do you think or what is going to be your advice for those two groups, whether actually they want to move forward with innovation double down or the other folks who are on the sidelines and they're expecting this tie to be over and then get on with the weather. So before that, uh, I don't know, Victor, before you answer it, I would like to share the rationale why I'm asking the question to you both. Uh, I don't know, you know, but I had the extensive corporate career, right? One of that mm -hmm. was the interesting gig in Hollywood studio. So I was the writing assistant there. So I get opportunity to go and sit there in the story discussion rooms. And is, you know, uh, how it goes, right? The writer will be sitting in the main chair and all around the room, associate writers will be there, note takers. And they will talk, they will start talking about a particular scene. Uh, maybe the conversation goes like this. Uh, the protagonist is walking on the road or maybe actually walking in the street, and he's also taking the dog with him. And then there is going to be a question like, is the dog leashed or unleashed? So they've been actually talking about this for almost like half an hour, one hour, and finally they will say that, you know what, let's put that into the parking lot, let's move on. They will just move on with the scene, and then the hero comes to the end of the street. And again, there is going to be a question, he is taking the right turn or he is taking the left turn? So people are going to be talking about all the pros and cons and two camps are going to be arguing, you know, finally how everything ends. Somebody is going to say that, let's ask the writer. 
because writer has the answer for all the questions and writer is having the authority of this is how it has to be done this is the right way of doing it so in this case i would say that you are the writers of innovation right with that notion can you just tell us what is right what is wrong here well <laughs> you will learn by experimentation <laughs> And so uh, the world is constantly changing, you know, and, and in our discussion, you know, we've made some predictions about things, but this is the most disruptive time that the world has faced probably since World War II. And, you know, back to what Brooke has said, for those trying to figure out, well, I'm just going to double down on my core products. Well, okay, but remember, every company today is a digital company. And so when you double down on those core products, you got to figure out how to use digital technology or your competition will and beat you at it. You know, look at GE and others if they struggled with this. And so everybody has to be very concerned about innovation, the use of digital technology. And if they double down on their core products as they are today, there's going to be some exceptions, obviously, but they're, not, they're going to get beaten by, by the competition. And, you know, there's research that's been done about how often, you know, a product life cycle has shrunk in the last 20 years. And so companies have to have a culture of innovation side by side and coexisting with their, their culture of excellence for their products and services that they do today and meeting their financial commitments. It's the life today. And they have to be agile about it. But, you know, if you're a company like Medtronic or a pharmaceutical or, or aerospace manufacturer, you know, where high reliability is critically important, yes, you have to keep all that, all those good things you do for reliability, but continue to innovate. And you can do that on the factory floor, in R&D, and then broadly across your platform. And as Brooke has said, they, they have to bring in their external partners and be looking down the road what are those disruptions that we can take advantage of or could kill us as a company? Awesome. And, you know, I, I just can't say that enough. And, and that's what I would always be telling executives. You know, you, you, you have to keep moving forward. And as Brooke is always championing, one of your employees is going to come in and tell you what that disruption is. We've got tons of examples of that with a, a cabinet maker Brooke worked with, uh, before I joined with them about how they his, used this tool and their employees told them what the new design should be because they were the young millennial mothers that they were building cabinets for. <laughs> so, you know, you, you just got to innovate. You got to keep working it and working it. And uh, as Brooke has pointed out, we have very powerful research that shows that companies that do innovate, they're the ones that are growing. They're more financially successful. Um, so that's a, no, oh, that's spot on. That's brilliant. Yeah. Well, and, I, and I would I would just uh, add to that, like you're right, Bella. There's a tendency for companies in these times to hunker down and say, okay, mm -hmm. you know, let's just get through this and wait. But that you know that that's the wrong thing to do. Um, you know, there's an interesting article that came out in the Boston Consulting Group, uh, the the, uh, the the matrix that they use to uh, track products and services and and most of the profits used to come from the cash cows of the organization. That has dropped off about 20% over a 20 year period. And there's more and more of the profitability coming from stars and question marks. So you think about that. So organizations need to be more nimble. They have to be quicker to market. They have to be quicker to pivot if necessary. So my response to your question is what should organizations be doing in this period i'd say a little bit of both I'm, I'm uh, yeah focus on your products and services but also uh you need to shift your thinking going forward and that's and that's without the, disrupting the organization because a lot of organizations majority of them aren't going to say no we're going to turn it all upside down and have all types of chaos and we'll come out the other end looking better they're not prepared to do that but mm -hmm. what they need to be doing at the very least is saying okay you know what we're going to start five percent ten percent starting to make some changes here. We're going to drop off 5% of the stuff that isn't adding value to free up resources to, to do some of the things that are going to provide more value down the line and get that 
kind of thinking going. So all of a sudden, then it becomes then embedded in the culture. They just do it. And successful organizations, 3M, Google, others, they've done that. You know, they don't awesome. have to tell their employees to spend time elsewhere. They're, they're doing it. And it works. Those are inspiring words. Thank you, Brooke and uh, Victor. This is a pretty exciting conversation. So I'm walking away with a lot of inspiration and especially I'm looking forward to all the great things that we can do together as two organizations, Innovation Minds, Innovation One, towards our success. Thank you for your time. We'll talk to you a later. pleasure. Then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke, and thank you, Victor. Yep.